Uh, welcome everybody to uh, setting the tone for 2021, creating energy solutions together. My name is David St. George. I am the communications coordinator here at Rethink Green, uh, and I have been involved with the project and had a chance to work with Simon and Angela and uh, all of the stakeholders involved, uh, or a lot of the stakeholders involved. Let me say this is actually a pretty amazing project and pretty excited to come together today uh, for this uh, piece. Uh, but before we start anything, it's always very important uh, that we start with our acknowledgements. So before we begin, the whole team at Rethink Green would like to acknowledge that we are present on Aboriginal lands that have been inhabited by Indigenous peoples from the beginning. As settlers, we're grateful for the opportunity to meet here. We thank all the generations of people who have taken care of this land for thousands of years. Long before today, there have been Aboriginal peoples who have been the, the stewards of this place. In particular, we acknowledge all territories in the context of Manitoulin Island and the North Shore regions and the locations from which all of our presenters will be speaking from today which include along the shores of Lake Huron, which is the traditional territory, the Hudsone, Iroquois, Ojibwe, Chippewa, and Anishinaabek, Subbury, the traditional territory of the Atikmekshing and Anishinaabeg, I apologize, uh, North Bay, the traditional territory of Nipissing First Nations and Anishinaabe, and Toronto, the ancestral ter uh, traditional territories, the Ojibwe, Anishinaabe, and Mississaugas of the North of the New Credit. We also recognize the contributions of the Métis, Inuit, and other Indigenous peoples have made both in shaping and strengthening our communities, our province, and our country as a whole. Together, we commit to make the promise and the challenge of truth and reconciliation real in our communities, and in particular, to bring justice for murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls across the country. So uh, with that said, it's actually pretty important that you know about what Rethink Green is. Uh, Rethink Green is a not-for-profit agency uh, uh, that works for environmental programs incubation. We correct, connect people and ideas together uh, for to create solutions for sustainability. Uh, right now, we're working on a pretty crazy goal that by 2030, we're going to have an engaged network of champions across 500 communities. And today, you guys are part of that. What's a network of champions? It's a network of people who are championing the cause of sustainability. And we just uh, it really just sounds like we want a bunch of friends, and that's really what it is. We want to foster an environment, a community of environmental champions. Uh, in Rethink Green, we got a, a bunch of great programs, including Smart Green Communities, which is the program that has developed the regional energy and emissions plans. That is their product uh, today and a major output uh, of the whole program. Now, funding for this uh, crazy idea that we've, uh, you know, we've been with for the past two years uh, has been by, provided by FCM, ISO, and the Environmental Defense Fund. So just a couple of quick housekeeping for the afternoon. Uh, the chat function uh, is just directly to me. I like being very popular. In reality, it's just that all of the hosts will have the questions. So if you have any questions, send them to me. We'll make sure we address them as we go. We just got a very tight timeline today. So we wanna make sure that everything's coming along, uh, but I, uh, I as most of the media rep, and I'll also get any questions as they come. All right. Uh, but first I would like to take things over to uh, a representative from the Federation of Canadian Municipalities. Uh, and then we're going to have our regional energy and emissions plan launch video. Then we're going to have some great presentations from our agency. And we got some really great guest speakers from Schneider Electric and Ontario Power Generations. And after that, we'll open it up for some round robin uh, questions and answers. But without further ado, because we are in a timeline, I want to pass things over to uh, Dustin Carey, Capacity Building Officer for the Municipalities of Climate Innovation Program. Take it away, Dustin. Thanks very much for having me here today. So um, when FCM was devising this program and pitching it to the federal government, there was a lot of excitement around it. Um, the Transition 2050 program was envisioned as a way to help communities across Canada uh, start to prepare roadmaps for that deep decarbonization and uh, trying to hit that um, zero by 2050 uh, goals entrenched in the Pan-Canadian Framework for Climate Change and the Economy and the Paris Agreement. So with an ambitious target like that, unsurprisingly, attracted a lot of attention by some of the regular players within the Beltway, the Torontos, Vancouver's, Montreal's, and other large population centers. And in 2018, when we were reviewing uh, the applications, um, Rethink Green was one of those special uh, applications that really caught our attention. It was uh, really trying to mobilize some of those municipalities outside of the population centers that you really frequently hear about and but nonetheless had a lot of ambition and when you look at the population distribution across Canada the municipality distribution only about um, or fewer than 60 communities across Canada have populations of over 50,000 um, out of 
uh, total number of communities numbering roughly 3,800. So to really get those emissions uh, targets and achieving them in a way that'll support uh, Canadian goals, you're going to have to engage many, many more of um, those population centers than the ones you really frequently hear about. And it's for that reason that approaches like the Regional Energy and Emissions Plan and really caught our attention. Ways to mobilize um, multiple communities at once, setting their goals, and uh, building those networks of mutual support um, and leveraging um, resources, expertise, things like that in a really collaborative way that can help push that needle forward um, in the communities that don't always have the same levels of support uh, that we see. Um, and again, those uh, communities that we most hear about. So yeah, it was um, something that really caught our attention and we've been thrilled to see the progress that's been made uh, over the past two years of this initiative. Um, I'm really looking forward to hearing about some of the details included uh, that have been developed in this session. And as FCM moves forward um, in the really ambitious energy emissions and reduction uh, space, um, as we see uh, COVID building back better green recovery initiatives come forward from the federal government. I think this is going to be a model that other communities across the country are going to have to look to um, as we plan more sustainable and equitable futures for this country. So thanks again for having me here today and I'm looking forward to the program. Thank you so much, Dustin. We really appreciate you uh, taking your time to join us today and all of the uh, support from FCM this entire process. Um, well, for those who want to see the work that we are talking about, it is currently live on smartgreencommunities.ca. Uh, we have flipped the switch and hit the button as well as uh, a report of consultation as well. So uh, if you want to do some light reading later tonight for 150 pages, I recommend it because it's got a lot of great research in there. We always joke about how big it is. But in reality, it needs to be a big document because it encompasses such an important topic and so many communities in that data. So, you know, I really recommend you guys look through that and it is on the website right now. Before we go to our next uh, our next video, which will be a message from our board, uh, which will be, sorry, the uh, introduction video, I'd actually like to play a video from one of our board members uh, opening address, Leslie, who took some time to share her thoughts on this process. I would like to take a moment to thank our sponsors and the 25 municipality, townships, and First Nations that helped make this project come to life. The first of its kind in the province of Ontario, the Regional Energy and Emissions Plans provides a snapshot of current trends and identifies opportunities to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, as well as mitigate the risks and effects of climate change across the 25 participating communities. The Regional Energy and Emissions Plans were funded by the Federation of Canadian Municipalities under its Transition 2050 program and the Independent Energy System Operator under its Education and Capacity Building program. The Transition 2050 program provided funding to support awareness, education, skills, and capacity building initiatives across four focus areas. These areas include community capacity building, understanding the collection and effective use of community data, skill building and project readiness training, and innovative projects and initiatives related to program objectives. This resulted in the creation of a regional energy and emissions planning advisory group for both Manitoulin Island and the North Shore communities with the capability to strengthen existing energy planning processes and broaden the scope of renewable clean and energy efficient solutions. The ISO funding was used to assist the delivery of training and support based services to our smart green community members, so they may achieve deeper greenhouse gas emission reductions through peer based learning strategic planning and operational implementation. Two accompanying reports of consultation will also be published alongside the plans, which identify how extensive community and stakeholder engagement has taken place across affected communities since the project's inception in 2017-2018. This project shows the collective efforts of the Northern Region 
by the power to make change at a frontline level by collaborating in the North. As a member of the board, I can speak to the excitement myself, as well as my fellow board members have about the success of the Regional Energy Ambitions Plan. We are extremely proud of Rethink Green for their exceptional dedication to the project and for their unwavering support for advancing environmental sustainability across Northern Ontario. I conclude this address by thanking you for your strong support and attention to the ongoing work of Rethink well, thank you very much, Leslie Kuto. Uh, she, we appreciate your your words and your support from the board. Uh, and now, uh, next will be a video, kind of talking about some of the things that we did. We did some interviews with some folks on Manitoulin Island. We also did some interviews with some folks on other municipalities. Uh, this is sort of some feedback on what they thought is important to them, and so how people already in our region are uh, taking care of the environmental uh, challenges facing them. I see someone's asked, is it possible to raise the volume? I will do that. Thank you for that. I appreciate that, guys. I'll raise that up for the next one. Uh, currently, uh, next, I have the honor of introducing Simon Blakely and Angela Zhang, who will be providing more details regarding the REAPs. You guys probably want to hear what's actually in these dang things at this point. Uh, Simon has a master's degree in urban uh, environmental design, an undergraduate degree in geography and planning, and a level two certificate in business principles, uh, principles of business administration. Now, Simon's gained about 16 years working in the public, private, and academic and not-for-profit sectors, during which time he has initiated and overseen a series of sustainable development-led projects and initiatives. Simon joined Rethink Green uh, April 2020 uh, as our program director has been at, as our program director then taking on a real challenge. You know, we had a lot of freedom. Something I don't know what's going on in 2020. But we suddenly had all this freedom to work. So Simon decided to take that big challenge at the time and, uh, you know, stick the cause of environmentalism regardless of the COVID pandemic. And then as our program director, he's been uh, you know, busy establishing and developing professional ties with businesses and stakeholders across a wider region across Northern Ontario. Now, Angela is about, has a Bachelor of Environmental Studies with Wilfrid Laurier and a postgraduate certification at Canada College in Environmental Management Systems. Angela joined Rethink Green back in May of 2019 as a program officer and has three years of experience working in sustainable industry, ranging from startups to not-for-profit, and she has been such a powerhouse on this, and we cannot have done this without her or Simon. So I'll, take, I'll let them uh, have the floor. Okay, hopefully everybody can hear me. Dave, can you signal? Perfect. All right, well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so it's my pleasure to join you from my home in the city of North Bay. Um, I too would like to take this opportunity to recognize the land on which I am presenting as being the traditional territory of the Nipissing First Nation Anishinaabe peoples. I also wish to echo comments made earlier regarding the importance of recognizing the history and contributions of indigenous peoples as part of our collective commitment to share truths and achieve the goal of reconciliation. Today we come together to launch two regional energy and emissions plans, forming part of a multi-year project in which we have examined energy and emissions trends on Manitoulin Island and the North Shore. The following slides provide further details regarding the municipalities, townships and First Nation communities covered within these reports. Next slide please. In regard to Manitoulin Island, from the map provided, you can see the study area extended from Whitefish River and Wemikong in the east to, to Coburn Island in the west. Next slide, please. In regard to the North Shore, from the map provided, you can see the study area extended from Nairn and Hyman in the east to the township of North Shore in the west. Next slide, please. Smart Green Communities uh, project began in 2017 and consisted of meetings, presentations, data collection and educational events, as part of which we engaged a broad and diverse range of stakeholders and communities across the 25 areas. To understand what energy planning means to them and how energy conservation applies in the context of climate change, plus the need to adapt and mitigate against predicted effects. So it's 
the screen's changing there. Um, so in the REAPs, uh, we identify a series of best practices which each region can adopt if they wish to. In particular, we've explored how low carbon development projects and solutions, including the examples of policies, plans, proposals and actions can be pursued by even the smallest municipality, township or first nation. The REAPs are not official documents, but they could provide a foundation for a regional approach to climate mitigation going forward. Our hope is the REAP sparks some interest and inspire these communities to work together and take collective action on climate change. So at this point, I'd like to also add that participation in the REAPs has been voluntary. Two accompanying reports of consultation produced alongside each REAP outlines the various steps that we've taken to engage the public and stakeholders at large. We wish to express our sincere gratitude to all of the participating communities, plus our funders for their dedication, for their dedication to this project and their overall commitment to building more sustainable communities here in Northern Ontario. So I'll now hand to Angela, who will provide some of the details regarding the methodology, the calculations and the predicted effects of climate change. Awesome. Hi, everyone. Thanks for the introduction, Simon and Dave. Uh, before I begin, I want to acknowledge this land in which I am located in Sudbury. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of Robinson Huron Treaty Territory, and the land I am on is the traditional territory of the Atikamesheng Anishinaabek. My name is Angela, and I'm the Smart Green Communities Program Officer. I've been on the role since May 2019, so I saw the beginning stages of the REAP through to now and the finalization of this two-year project. I'm very excited to have been part of this journey. The REAP was developed to get a snapshot of the current status of energy use and emissions on Manitoulin Island and North Shore to suggest some of the actions and policies needed to achieve energy and emission reduction goals. With that in mind, the REAP has identified energy and emission calculations by sector of municipality, community, households, and transportation. Such as sections in the REAP, energy consumptions by a municipality, estimated community household energy use and emissions and secondary energy use, as well as total vehicle kilometer traveled and fuel usage per person as per population in Manitoulin Island and North Shore respectively. The energy and emissions data was calculated using publicly available sources of data, including Ontario public sector data uh, identified in Ontario Regulation 507-18, which is titled Broader Public Sector Energy Reporting and Conservation Demand Management Plans. This regulation requires municipalities and public sector services such as post-secondary institutions, hospitals, and school boards to report their yearly energy use and greenhouse gas emissions, and also to produce a report of current and proposed measures for conserving and energy consumption reduction and energy demand management. Uh, additional data was acquired from Census Data, Statistics Canada, uh, Ministry of Transportation, as well as Natural Resources Canada. Next slide, please. And on to the calculations. So with any data set and calculations, there will always be some sort of margin of error. And because much of this data has been retrieved from publicly sourced, it is difficult to account for the methodology in which data was originally collected and reported. There may be gaps in the consistency of data collection, which is difficult to account for. And it is essentially a missing piece of a puzzle to the larger picture. That said, our calculations and emissions, estimations of current energy use and emissions identified within the REAP provides a detailed and robust estimate of the known average annual emissions applying 2016 as the baseline year. The REAPs can also be referenced as part of a larger conversation to help reduce emissions and mitigate and adapt to the predicted risks and effects of climate change. Going forward, Smart Green Communities advocates that all communities take steps to report their data so as to stay consistent and provide a true reflection of identified energy use and associated emissions. Next slide. Now for the predicted impacts, it is hard to see carbon and greenhouse gas emissions by the naked eye. It is not black or white, and it certainly is interconnected by various factors. The impact of emissions from any given source will have an effect in the environment all around us. Some of the findings indicated in the REAP discusses business as usual scenarios, which is defined as 
the projection of future climate scenarios associated with growth if no action or policies was taken to implement to address emissions. And essentially it would be a, what would the future look like? Not to get too grim on my messaging here, but Manitoulin Island and North Shore regions have already seen flooding events, forest fires, ice storms that have shut down roads, disrupted critical services and affected the health and safety of the residents. Brownouts resulting in the disruption of energy distribution, transmission and supply systems are becoming increasingly common and energy blackouts remain a very distinct possibility. Typically, this is caused by high and low precipitation periods, variable temperature changes within seasons and unpredictable weather patterns. The REAP projects that such events will occur more frequently and with larger, more devastating consequences if a business as usual approach continues. However, the future remains positive and we can all work together on addressing the issues of climate change by adapting and mitigating the risks. And smart green communities want to continue to work with municipalities, First Nations communities to help achieve their emission goals and to create a more sustainable environment that we are so blessed with in Northern Ontario. I would pass it back to Simon to discuss what's in store for future and next steps. Okay. So thank you, Angela. Um, and just to remind everybody uh, watching, we are more than happy to explain any of the data sets and recommendations contained within the REAPs and how these could impact your community. So from our presentation so far, you may be able to detect that the real elephant in the room is climate change itself and the many uncertainties and disruptions which climate change related events could bring to our daily lives. It seems we have a choice. The question is, will we seize this moment and see it as a turning point or will we continue to inflict damage on our planet until it reaches a tipping point? For those unfamiliar, tipping points generally preceded by gradual and low impact changes, which over time continue to occur more frequently until the point of collapse, at which time the damage is irre irreversible. Tipping points are sometimes considered in relation to feedback loops, whereby the output of a system affects itself. One well-known example is the ice albedo feedback loop, whereby ice has a higher reflectivity than land or water. And this means it is able to reflect the heat back into the atmosphere than, uh, better than either bare land or water can. So with temperatures rising, the Arctic sea ice is melting more rapidly in the summer months and the oceans are being forced to absorb more heat and retain it. Next slide, please. Some of you may now be asking what is next. Since early last year, the COVID-19 pandemic has undoubtedly taken precedence and we have all experienced disruption in our lives and livelihoods. The vaccination program is now being rolled out. We still have a long way to go until any sense of normality resumes. But as different movements around the world have shown, a large body of people, if not the majority, have indicated they are not interested in going back to a business as usual approach not least where such actions are known to adversely impact the very people, communities, and environments that we all depend on. And building upon what has now become a deep-rooted movement, policymakers, influencers, industrialists, and others from all political persuasions are now speaking out about the pending climate, climate crisis. With fears of a global economic recession, a very distinct possibility, Governments, businesses, not-for-profits, communities, households, individuals around the world are asking themselves, how can we build back better? Ultimately, it seems we need to invest in a green economy that is more sustainable, resilient, and compatible with nature. Next slide, please. As a, at the global scale, the main barometer of progress to date remains the Paris Agreement of 2015 in which a long-term goal was established to keep the increase in global average temperatures to well below two degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels and to pursue efforts to limit the increase to 1.5 degrees. These recommendations were informed by an International Panel on Climate Change IPCC report published in 2018 which said global emissions of carbon dioxide must peak by 2020. A further meeting of global nations is scheduled to take place in Glasgow, United Kingdom, in November 2021 at the 26th session of the Conference of the Parties. With a recent commitment by Joe Biden, US administration, to re-enter the Paris Agreement, it is hoped that other countries around the world may follow suit 
and that stronger targets and actions can be established. Next slide, please. So the Federal Government of Canada has published its updated climate plan in December 2020, entitled A Healthy Environment and a Healthy Economy. Canada's strengthened climate plan to create jobs and support people, communities and the planet. The climate plan is an ambitious target setting document which aligns with international commitments made within the pan-Canadian framework on climate change and provides an overarching framework to both inform existing and future policy goals. The climate plan identifies where and how funding streams, financial incentives and other rebates could be used by the government. Prime Minister Trudeau and President Biden met for the first time on Friday evening, further to which it has largely been reported that climate change is a shared priority. Next slide, please. At the provincial level, several major projects continue to be discussed, which, if implemented in a coordinated, sustainable and, in and inclusive manner, could result in long-term benefits to Northern Ontario, while also assist assisting our efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Specific projects include the proposed reinstatement of a passenger railway network to provide a more modern, efficient and viable alternative for individuals in Northern Ontario, such as the North Shore, who may be seeking access to the GTA and vice versa. The long debated Ring of Fire too, plus other mini uh, mining, uh, resource and forestry management led projects could herald a new era for Northern Ontario engineers, designers and manufacturers. Clean technologies and products will be required to both reduce our dependency on fossil fuels and create more sustainable practices. And in all cases, stakeholder engagement and public consultation will be needed. Next slide, please. So over the past week, I was present at two regional conferences, including the Northern Policy Institute's Circular Economy Symposium, and the Independent Energy System Operators Annual Energy Conference. From these events, I was reassured to discover that new policies and plans are in the works, which could guide us going forward. At this point in the presentation, I will briefly plug the existing programs and services offered by Rethink Green, including Smart Green Communities and Green Economy North. In delivering these programs, we provide support to municipalities, townships and First Nations and businesses, as they seek to measure their footprint, manage their impact, reduce their emissions and save money. The benefits of membership include baseline energy walkthroughs, target setting and action planning, coaching and support, access to technical workshops, green team development, networking, knowledge sharing and celebrations of achievements. With incentives on the way, now is the time to plan ahead. Next, next uh, slide, please. So some best practice examples of indiv individuals and households can do to help uh, mitigate their footprint uh, include behavioral changes, uh, such as reducing electricity consumption at times of peak demand, choosing emission-free or lower emission uh, methods of transportation, selecting reduced emission goods, including locally sourced and manufactured products, and also using technology uh, to telephone, video calls to help avoid any unnecessary in-person meetings. And I believe most of us have discovered that during the pandemic. So another step would be to implement energy efficiency measures, such as installing a programmable thermostat, periodically replacing air filters in air conditioners and heaters, replacing incandescent lights with LEDs, properly sealing and insulating your home, and washing full loads of laundry in cold water where possible. You can also invest in electric vehicles, as uh, Tyler, one of our presenters, may say today. Another point to mention here is the importance of behavioural science, and how to make uh, greenhouse gas emissions visible so people can see how to the need to take action. The REAPS identify a strategy applied by the University of California's Engage Building Performance Project, which involved the use of smart meters to track real-time energy usage and send the data to residents in the form of weekly reports. Next slide, please. One great example for Manitoulin Island uh, for businesses is that set by Craig and Katie Timmermans, the owners of CFRM 100.7 and Country 103, who are widely acclaimed for having developed Canada's first green radio station. This can operate entirely off the grid. 
Located in Little Current, a two-story, 2,400 square foot studio office at One Radio Road is also home of the Manitoulin Country Fest grounds. It is equipped with 24 solar panels and four wind turbines. Other initiatives include using waste vegetable oil from food trucks and restaurants to generate electricity via a homemade bio biodiesel generator. Next slide, please. At the community level, the REAP identifies how uh, communities can benefit from the delivery of public education and awareness campaigns that reduce the demand for energy. The integration of climate change awareness and education in schools is another important step. For example, a greenhouse project undertaken at Wikwemikong High School, which was built and managed by students to encourage hands-on learning, agricultural techniques and broader business practices. The greenhouse will also help the community become more self-sufficient. The inclusion of local knowledge keepers and community champions, such as an example at Sioux, the city of Sault Ste. Marie, which recently adjusted its Environmental Sustainability Committee to include additional community members will be key to allowing the city to gain more diverse perspectives and proceed to develop action plan items to implement its greenhouse gas production plan. Also on the island, United Manitoulin Island Transportation is a non-profit, multi-stakeholder, cooperative organisation which introduced a community-led bus service in the summer of 2020. The 14 passenger seat bus is fully equipped with wheelchair accessibility and secure fastening for personal mobility devices. At the time of publication of the REAPS, UMIT has 16 stops across several communities on the island. Next slide, please. So as a necessary first step, towns, cities and communities across Canada, including here in Northern Ontario, have been declaring climate change emergencies, producing inventories, calculating the greenhouse gas emissions and relying upon this data to produce GHG emission reduction targets, climate action plans and other guiding documents. Some of the more advanced communities are introducing strategic and operational plans to ensure all decisions made are viewed from a climate lens. And they're invested in systems for monitoring and reporting on greenhouse gas emissions and actively promoting new and innovative approaches to land use management and building design standards. They're also investing in renewable energy projects. Next uh, slide, please. So as the REAP suggests, a lot of action is already occurring on the ground. However, there is still plenty of work for us to do as we go about developing solutions to build a more sustainable environment, society and economy. Increasing numbers of youth, youth are expressing their sense of hopelessness. They know changes come in, but many, for many it's not happening fast enough. At this point, I would like to recognise the extraordinary efforts of the young Swedish schoolgirl and activist Greta Thunberg, a hero to many, both young and old, who has been unwavering in her efforts to promote social and environmental justice. In particular, I would like to quote Greta, Greta's statement made before a rally in Copenhagen, Denmark in 2019, where she said, Today, we use 100 million barrels of oil every day. There are no politics to change that. There are no rules to keep the oil in the ground. But if being carbon neutral does not include transportation, shopping, food, aviation and shipping, then it really doesn't mean that much. Some would say we are wasting time. We would say we are changing the world. So we can look back and say we did everything that we could. So we continue to follow science for the future and for our living planet. Ultimately, we will need to decide who we are as Canadians. Putting the politics aside, the REAPs do identify that a more resilient and energy, energy efficient grid will be necessary in any case for us to withstand the predicted effects of climate change. The honest answer is there is no one size fits all solution. All communities are unique in terms of their assets, issues, challenges and opportunities. And sustainable development requires a more of a smorgasbord approach. So the final point I would like to make here is simply, we can do this. Now is the time for us all to play our part as we strive towards a more sustainable future. So thank you everybody for your time and I will now hand back to Dave for part two of today's webinar, Creating Energy Solutions Together. Thank you so much, Simon and Angela. I appreciate that, uh, that run through and uh, that look at the data. A lot of interesting stuff there uh, and a lot of powerful imagery as we go forward. 
you know, we're talking about sort of climate here locally, but, you know, it's good to be reminded how it affects us globally as well, um, you know, and in both have a role to play um, and, and how that affects us. When I used to work in disaster management, I learned quickly that weather wins every time, weather causes floods, weather uh, changes livelihoods. And now that I'm working in the environmental sector, uh, I learned that we have the opportunity to, uh, to have a role in how that weather affects us in future weather patterns and in climate change. So uh, to see some of that imagery was pretty powerful. Thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, now I will hand things over to uh, one of our guests as we start the second part of our slide of our uh, event today. But first I will give him a good uh, uh, an introduction. Let me pull that up here. My apologies, there we go, all right. So uh, next I'm gonna introduce 